Okay, so we're recording. It's really helpful. If you have Fly to Learn, X-Plane uh, 10 on your computer, go ahead and run it now. Um, it would be great if you could run it at the same time so you can practice the same things. We're going to go over, uh, again, some differences between X-Plane 9 and 10 for those who might have had it. We're going to just a real quick run through of the first lessons, but our goal is to really use Plane Maker tonight and get you working on that. We have another video, uh, set of videos scheduled, webinars scheduled for March 6th, and then we will also do some more after that. So we do a lot of the repeat webinars, so if you need it, or we'll go into more dense, the advanced topics. Today we're going to go on all the basic topics to get everybody started, then advanced. Now we do have some questions here, and um, also have some things you can download if you want that. Let me see here. Question six. Let's pull out it. Okay, people are saying they you know, saw everything. What else? Curriculum is some videos. I got fly learn and select a resource, but the links video is working. I have, again, we're putting stuff up, folks. We literally switched over to the new webinars. I have lots of videos with X Plane 9. We're bringing X Plane 10 on. Um, and there will be the, uh, what, this webinar will be posted on YouTube late tonight. So that way you'll get that. And we'll be adding more curriculum and videos as this goes through. So I will get this out to you all. All right. So this will be helpful for those folks who need to see it now to get started. Remember, when it first starts, uh, starts up, you're going to get something called Quick Flight Setup. We're doing everything from Boeing's Field, and uh, this is in um, Seattle. It will say that in your curriculum instructions. We're using a Cessna 172, which is my wonderful red pointer, that airplane. We're doing day and we're doing overcast. The reason we're overcast is so you can see the square. Got another question here. Will the recordings be available to us? Yes, they will be. Yes, they will be. And they'll be available later tonight. All right, what's the next item? Where do we find the videos? Uh, we will have, I will send out an email link to everybody um, where I'll ask. Miriam from uh, Gamma, and we will go ahead and send an email link with a uh, subscription, not, a, not like um, a playlist, that will have the videos on there for you. Will that work out for everybody? Is a playlist idea okay with everybody? I'll send this up. This will be on YouTube. And that way, if you're on the playlist, as we make more videos, as we keep adding videos, you'll see a playlist for everyone, okay? Some schools have. Let me know if it's not. All right. Everybody's at this webinar. I can send it to you tonight. Can a plane in X Plane 10, can a plane be downloaded to a simulator, precision flight control pod, and run in X Plane 9? Well, no. no. Um, what I would suggest for that person that's asking about X Plane 9. Uh, using a simulator precision flight control product. Please send me who's precision flight control. Are you talking about a joystick or you a full-fledged simulator, Todd? Todd, I think you wrote me a question. Can a plane created in X-Plane 10 be downloaded to simulate a precision flight control product run in X-Plane 9? Um, if it, because we can talk to them about it. The software is pretty inexpensive. It's a simulator. Okay. Um, no, 9 runs, 10 won't run 9. Um, or 9 will not run 10 because 9 is 10 years older. Um, I will put this down and reach out to them and explain we have 10 out here now. Let me get with them. So that way we can update this stuff. So that's precision flight control. All right, great. Let me uh, put that in my notebook right now. Though I usually have a list of all these. I'm going to put down precision flight control. And just a real... When we're at, if time permits at the end of this, I'm just going to ask you some... What would you like to see us come out we're going to look at the lessons. Now I'm going to um, got some questions about what you would like to see come out for the X-Plane. Um, 
what kind of lessons we do next. All right, so here, let's go ahead, though. We're at this is a quick flight setup. I go ahead and fly with these options. My computer's booting up on that. While my this loads, let me go ahead and pull up. There is our curriculum. If you've got it, here's our table of contents. These right here, aspect ratio, wing loading, power loading, is airplane design. The advanced topics, we go ahead. You can you can throw those in there if time permits. If you want to go into greater depth. Can I get a show of hands? If we did something with quadcopters, man quadcopters, you're seeing more and more of that. Would that be an interest to your students or students to you all? And the teachers, raise your hand if you'd be interested in that. If we had a whole lesson where you had a quadcopter. All right, great. All right, so we got about 50% there. That's awesome. All right, you can hear mine kicking up. All right, now, just so you know, you've got the right version of X-Plane 10. It should say Flight to Learn Aviation Challenge on the bottom. I will explain. We license X-Plane 10. We license X-Plane 9. We have a license to use their software once they come out with a new version. But it's not just an old version of the software. We actually build in some capabilities in it that aren't in normally X-Plane 10. So one way to know that you have is make sure you see that aviation challenge. If you need to get back to set up again, you just go into... I don't know why this computer is acting slow here. Quick flight setup. Right there. All right, so under file, quick plane setup to get back there. So if a student crashes airplane, you want to get started, that's what you do. The other thing, I'm sorry, you're, if you hear some equipment, I'm Hope you don't hear the equipment in the background. We are a fab lab. I'm the fab lab director as well, and we've got it. So go to location. Let's just review that real quick. Go to... Okay. Hang on one second, guys. I'm going to get another mouse. Okay, there we go. Let me just hook this in because my Bluetooth mouse is not getting it done right now. All right, great. There we go. I'm going to pause it. Now, right here, all right, it's paused. Local map is right there. So that's where we pull off the local map. But for right now, let's just take a look at this screen, if I can get it to come up here. Hit B for brakes. Not sure. All right. So we click on B for brakes. Nice.
trying to push that in. Folks, for some reason this is just acting strange. I apologize. We're not getting a response in the software right now. As you can tell, I'm struggling with it, and I'm not exactly sure why it's suddenly doing this. So I'm trying to kill the sound on this. All right, let's go over here. I will try to reboot it back up, but clearly having an issue. We can start getting going on Plane Maker here. Then I'll come back to it once I can boot it back up. Bear with me one more moment. I apologize. I'm going to force quit out this. All right. So we'll try this one more time. Bear with me one second. I'm not going to run this software until we get the plane maker. Now hold on one moment. What I'm going to do is I've got still shots. I'll bring those up. I'm not sure why it's doing that right now, but. I'll stay on here longer. We'll get through what we need to get through tonight. I apologize. All right, let's go just through this real quick. We'll bring it, I'll start up explaining again a little bit. Not sure what quite happened there. But let's jump down to where we all are. What I did want to tell everybody, does it require, it does not require a joystick. You can fly it with a mouse. Runs on older computers than, say, X-Plane 11 would. All right, then... We'll be adding presentations materials as they come up. The simulator, X-Plane Flight Simulator, and what's important tonight, it includes Plane Maker. Okay, we got some questions here. Go ahead and pull it down. I want to make sure everybody can see what I'm doing. Why doesn't it crash when you're running into things on the runway? I'm going to check. I'll go back and look at our settings on that, Marion. My guess is that thing has been turned off. I have a student that is playing with Ospreys as well. Wow. Okay. That's that's impressive. All right. Those are hard to fly. All right. The first basic 10 lens are science themes. 
Last four lessons are more engineering themes, and then we have those advanced lessons. Okay, so that's what we did. Here where we are, remember we're at S T Seattle Tacoma is another one. Boeing Field is another place we take off from. Sus 172, day overcast, hit fly. When you're paused, it's going to look like that. You're going to turn off the takeoff, you're going to turn off the brakes, and you're going to push in the throttle. The brakes are off, the throttle's pushed in, you unpause this. There's a white square here, you can barely make it out, but there is a white square there. You want to run your pointer in that, and it'll take off. Get it up, get your throttle right here, this control, up above 60 or so knots, and you'll be doing just great. The, this is an artificial horizon indicator. If it's all blue, you're going up. If it's all brown, you're not surprised when you're going down. There's your altimeter telling you how high above your sea level, um, not how high you are above the ground. Now, we're at sea level being in Seattle right there, but many Apollo has flown into a mountain because it said 3,000 feet above sea level. The problem, say, in, Char in North Carolina, we have mountains that are 4,000 square feet, so that would be a problem for you. Um, those are probably the instruments we use the most of in the here in the beginning. Now, what the first lesson was, just I'm going over this really quick, was looking at using learn planning to use the software, planning to use uh, talk about energy management, kinetic per versus potential energy. Kinetic is the speed energy of speed, potential is the energy of altitude and the trade-offs. You don't create energy; it just simply changes forms and in lesson two, the kids are introduced, and you'll be if you're a student, you're introduced to uh, collecting data off the airplane. So you fly the airplane with three different weight uh, loads of there, three different loads of more and more increasing weight as a result of increasing mass. And uh, we track the speed of the aircraft, the distance traveled, and the landing gear vertical forces. When those are zero, you know you're off the ground, and you can get a graph off of that. So let me show you the differences here. Before, you're not collecting data on the left cockpit. You won't see anything. Collecting data, there it is. But honestly, that gets to be a little bit hard seeing that. So if we select the local map, so this screen got just moved up here. We'll move this back where it really goes. Um, let's go back. Let me move this while I get it back to All right. When you take off, the reason we track those landing gear vertical forces, see where it says gear vertical? Those tell you when those all go to zero, that means all your tires are off the ground. That's what we track it with. And then based on that, we can look at distance traveled, vertical height. So you have a table, you fill that out, and you repeat it, and you graph it. Now, when you do the map, do this. We'll move it to two places. When you go to a local map, you can then do load airport. This will take you to this screen right here, final approach or takeoff. So here's the Seattle Tacoma, and we can do all those things. And you know, there's a different ramp exit. You can start, you can customize all these things. Don't worry about that right now. We're going to be using the takeoff and final approaches. All right. To answer why it doesn't tra crash into things, there used to be deer on the runway. It didn't crash under them either. So it's uh, your impact set up on this. Now, under lift, what we talked about yesterday is we talked about, well, how can you get these lift vectors up? And if you go under special and show flight mode, it will show this these vectors and you can see if the vectors are mainly green that's lift in the vertical there's yellow that's a lift in the horizontal and then finally induced drag there's two types of induced there's two types of drag induced and parasitic induced is the result parasitic is think of sticking your hands out the window that's drag due, due to the body moving through a, a fluid in this case air uh, but uh, induced is the result of lift you pay a little cost for lift but you can see there's a lot of lift for just a little bit of drag, so it's a good deal. Okay.
Then we talked about um, angle of attack and the importance of lift. And angle of incidence is actually built into the wing. And what you realize that lift is a result of two things. Angle of attack and airspeed. And we do that in a minute. You'll see it in the lessons well, how we do that. But we're basically going to stall the airplane. The airplane is no longer generating lift and falls out of the sky. And then we show you how we get lift back. It's actually quite fun the thing to do in a small airplane. It's like a roller coaster. Now, we are kind of agnostic on this. Some pe If you're at an airport, you get half the people there will tell you it's Bernoulli principle that causes an airplane to fly. And the other half are just rightly convinced it's Newton's third law. We give both explanations. All right. Mainly, we just know there's lower pressure on the top of the wing and the bottom of the wing, and that causes it to lift up. Now, what we do in this is we take the airplane, and in this lesson, you take the airplane, you point the nose up, and then you will go fly, 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 and these life victors will start falling down. Once it stalls, you should point the nose down, the plane starts going down. You'll see as the airspeed increases, the lift does go up. Well, it goes up dramatically when you add, pull back a little bit on the joystick, on the nose, you, you add a little bit of angle of attack, and then it goes up dramatically. So it's both things. All right. Drag, we're using a plane like this one. Um, this is actually an X-Plane 9 screenshot, but it'll work for what we're trying to do. And right here, and I like this shot, so that's what we kept it. Right here, we increase flaps. Flaps are really kind of cool in that they both increase drag and increase lift. So you can fly your airplane at a slower speed to land. Then thrust is just, you're going to have the kids land. My comment on thrust is, it takes, and landing is, you control your altitude with thrust. So what most people think you do is to land an airplane and you point the nose down. When for the most part you don't do that, you just keep taking away thrust and the plane keeps coming down. All right? Not always true on an aircraft carrier, you never do that. We also use the PAPI system right here and with the precision altitude indicator, flight path, it's a path indicator. So if it's too white, too red, you're great. If it's all white, it's overflight, you're flying too high. If it's all red, not surprisingly, you're dead, you're too low. Now, this is where we would stop. If you have plenty of time, I would suggest here's a great time now, if you wanted to, to if say you did this over a week, teachers. A nice thing to do is to break it up and make buy these small little balsa wood airplanes, jet stream, talk about the four forces of flight, and how would you prove that little airplane? So here it comes. So some of the things you can do right off the bat is get rid of weight. Like, so here it is all finished, all put together. And then you talk to the students, well, what can we do to make it fly better? And then hopefully they're going to say, hey, I'm going to get rid of weight. I might get a better rubber band, cut this back. Again, weight's always a problem. We also talk about stability now, and that kind of lesson six, that you need lift, but you also need control, and part of that is being a stable airplane. So you might end up with something like this, bigger rubber band, there's no pilot, no landing gear. We add wing tips for dihedral. What that does is allow if one wing tips down, the other wing actually gets less left, and it corrects. You get a lot, you create a lot of negative feedback loops, and that's what you really want. You know, if one wing drops real low, you want the other wing to drop and the wing that dropped low to come back up. And we and we're as you can see in the lesson, we talk a lot about it. Well, if you make these modifications, the plane, when it's in this condition, flies two or three seconds tops. These can fly 5, 10, 15 seconds. I've had one fly away on us. So we got into a draft and just did great. No, let's go ahead and we're going to see on the lesson. I want to go right now to... Back into here, and let's go to lesson seven with aspect ratio. And then we'll bring up plane maker. All right. All 
All right. So let's go. It's actually now less than eight. Aspect ratio. All right. You can do the previous lessons. They just go in more detail the very things we've been talking about. It's a coefficient of lift and drag, and you're going to actually do the formulas for doing it. But for now, let's go right over to aspect ratio, the first of the engineering problems. And what we're trying to do here, and you can actually see, uh, since I'm showing you the teacher one, you can see the calculations. We have the kids calculate the aspect ratio, and that's the wingspan of the airplane divided by the cord of the airplane. So think length divided by width. All right? So if this is 10, it's going to be slightly more than 2. This one spans 4 foot. The cord's 4. It's 0.083. That's not very good. And um, you can get huge wings. Get, uh, gliders have very high aspect ratios. All right? So then what we do is have them calculate... We're going to do some takeoffs, and we're going to change the aspect ratios, and they'll do the calculations, and they're going to calculate takeoff distances. Now, how do, well, okay, that's great, but how in the world are we going to test this? Well, we're going to go in there, and we're actually going to the plane maker, and I'm going to pull it up right now. So, if you've got it, it's going to be in the same folder that X plane's in. What's great is, you make it in plane deck maker, you can fly it in an X-plane. Say, so, hey, we're going to open it from the web. Thank you very much. Let's pull it up. Okay. All right, now this is the first thing you might see, a tube. Not really helpful. So right now, folks, we're in Plane Maker. We're not in X Plane anymore. All right? So if you've got it, please bring it up so you can see this. Then we're going to go under File. We're going to Open. And we're going to go into Aircraft 10 right here. Then go into General Aviation. Okay, then, so you've got Cessna. These are all airplanes we can start messing with. But what I would suggest is if you go under X, air, extra aircraft, you can go into van RVs. The only issue with this, they moved it into there. The issue gets to be the kids are going to want to fly all kinds of these crazy airplanes. I always argue... You can do that once we get the lessons done. So go to Van RV 10 and double click on that. Open the aircraft. There it is. I hit the space bar. It goes from solid to the black and white. All right. Now, here's where it gets interesting. We don't want to mess up your Van RV-10, so the next class can do this. So we make copies of it right off the bat. We make copies right off the bat on it. So we want to make a copy of this airplane. So, and you can see it over here if I can get it. We're going to take the Van RV. All right. I don't know why it's in the highlight. Well, I highlight here, apparently. Okay, because I'm not in there. All right, we'll be that way. Let's go back up to the pointer. All right, so, go back over there. All right, so... You're going to copy these and save them. You're going to do save as, and it says it right in there. Now it says RV10 down here. You're going to save it, the first name of your student, and then 50. And you might even do, you might do something like, for aspect ratio, aspect ratio, 
student's name, I'm going to say Tom, and I'm going to say 50. AR50, press enter. And it'll say now, AR Tom 50. Then I'm going to say the same thing again. Save as. Same thing, only except this time, make it 40. Just like it says over here. If you look on Lesson 9, it's got it right there. 40, 30, 20. You're going to name it the wingspan. Those will be our test mules. That way you don't mess up your original van RV. Any questions about that so far? Okay, no questions? All right, then, so I've already, uh, I've already saved a couple here. So we got 50 and 40. So then once I've done that, I've got them here. We're going to go into the table and where it says first name 50, we're gonna change the wing semi-length. Let me see if I can get that to pop up. So right here, I'll highlight it there. Okay. Oh, we just had, it looks like a question. Let me go through that. Where do you access PlaneMaker? In the same folder that um, X-Plane's in. So if you search your computer for it, you'll find it. It'll be right next to X-Plane. So open up your X-Plane folder, and you'll find it in there. All right, now we've got that. We're ready to, um, so right there, they're finally getting the pen. So this table is what we're gonna use, okay? So right all over in here is where we're gonna go through it. So how do we get into that table? We go up to standard, let me see if I can get this thing to go back to a pointer. Let me see if I'll bring it back. Yeah, it's not. All right. We're going to go standard wings. All right. There's wing one, two, three, and four. That just starts getting in the wing tips and things. And that's... There's been a quite a little bit of a change. So this needs to be wing three. So we'll get into this in one moment. All right, so here we go, wing one. We're going to go up to, say, okay, 50-foot wingspan. Wing one semi-length is 25 feet. So I'm going to make this 25 feet. All right, wing two. All right, lateral arm is 24 See, and it's, if you look at this right now, this way it'll, I'm making it bigger. See, if I didn't do that, if I left it at 14, you would see those are inside there. In fact, if I go out of this, the wingtips are gone. They didn't move out with the wing. The wing's longer, but the wingtips are gone. So if I go back into standard, go into wings, I'm going to go into 14, wait a minute, 24, 95. There it is. And then you got a vertical arm. I'm going to go increase that because these aren't really lining up yet. Let's go back out. I'll show you what I mean. They're there, but they're not quite lined up properly. So go standard. Again, look at the table. We've done this for you. So I don't have to worry about it. And it's 0.25. Now, we've got our airplane. With the 25 foot, it's a 50 foot wingspan, it's 25 on each end. Then you can go into X plane and you can find this airplane. So this is Tom 40. I'm going to make this Tom 50 since I've done that. 
file, save as. And I'll just replace my existing plan. See, it has no qualms, by the way, saving over your existing plane. So that's why don't make these changes in the RV10. Because once you do that, then you don't have your original. All right, we've got some hands raised. Let me see if people have questions. And I'm just not seeing it. All right. Matthew, do you have a question? I Can I unmute you? Leave your hands up if you have a question. I'm going to ask each person that has a question on here. Start with Todd. Todd, do you have a question? Let me see if this audio will come up better. Todd, do you have a question? Okay. You don't have Todd on there. Matthew, do you have a question? If you would, write your question down. Maybe we'll get it to see it that way, too. Todd, do you have a question? All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and move on then. If you got a question, just write it in there. We'll come back to it. All right. So that, you're going to look at average takeoffs again. There'll be more flying, more questions. We'll ask, well, what does aspect ratio do? And then, depending on what the aspect ratio does, if, well, if I can take off on a shorter runway, why doesn't every airplane have this kind of aspect ratio? And that answer comes back to because not every plane has a different kind of, most airplanes have different jobs. And there are trade-offs in engineering. And it's an optimization of those trade-offs. Best bang for the buck is a way to think of that, is what makes a great airplane. But if you look at it, civilian airplanes look very similar. There's a reason for those. Those are the optimized trade-offs. All right. You know, you can have a really large aspect ratio, but the trade-off you give there is your handling isn't as good. Well, maybe you're a big airliner, that's not as important. If you're a combat pilot, it's super important. Okay, put everybody's hands down here. All right, now... So... That was the aspect ratio. The next lesson after that is we start adding, it's called wing loading. And in that, we start calculating wingspan, the cords, how much wing area, and how much weight of the airplane is. So you look at wing loading. And these are all things you'll do for the competition anyway, so you'll need that. We're going to ask you some questions about that. When you do the calculations, you'll add weight to this airplane. You're going to see how it flies. All right, and then we get into power loading. Let's talk about power loading because this is a um, fairly important concept. Brake horsepower requires the equal power to overcome drag. Thrust horsepower requires brake horsepower divided by 0.8. Well, what do we mean by that? Why are we saying that? Well, remember, we need horsepower to come overcome drag. Once we overcome drag, we can get start to build up speed. Once we build up speed, we can develop with some right angle of attack. We can get lift. But the issue gets to be, is the engine 100% efficient? Is all the horsepower coming out of that engine going to overcome drag? And the answer is no. The propeller is about 80% efficient. So 80% of the power of the 100% of the power the engine gets 
puts to the to airplane, we lose 20% because the propeller is just going to lose it. It's not 100% efficient. We would never expect it to be. Now, to give you an amazing fact, the Wright brothers' early props were within 79%. So they did a remarkable job. You know, that's one of the great insights of them, that they realized that propeller was nothing more but a moving wing. So in any case, you have brake horsepower, thrust horsepower comes over that. And then, okay, so what's cruise horsepower? Well, you don't want to run your engine at maximum speed power just to keep it in the air. You only want to run it at like 75%. So we divide it by 75%, which makes the number even grow higher. So if you start off at 100 and you divide that by 0.80, it's going to be a higher number than divided by 0.75. Again, it's even going to be a higher number. So you can see that an airplane needs a lot more horsepower to overcome drag than just what the theoretical minimum would be. In other words, if you've calculated on your airplane, you said, wow, I just need 60 horsepower. Yeah, that's the brake horsepower. What are you going to do about the fact your propeller is going to give you all the horsepower? What are you going to do with the fact that you can't run an engine full blast all the time? You'll wear out the engine. Is that making sense, everyone? Okay. Next question. All right, next part of this. All right. Putting it all together. Now, this and this is why we came up with FlyLearn. We wanted kids to be able to design their airplane, see their design, and see how it changes. And, you know, this is where the scientific method is different from the engineering method. Scientific method, we ask a question. We test the question, our hypothesis. We try to prove our hypothesis is false. And so... You can never do too many experiments to test your hypothesis. But you keep everything identical, you run the experiment. You do it again, everything identical, you run the experiment. You keep doing that over and over again. In engineering, we use science, but we do an iterative process where we test it and we say, well, we can make this improvement. We make the improvement. Test it again. We improve it. Test it again. Uh, my students are making a rubber band Gatling gun which is actually kind of a neat project. And right now we're going through all these iterations of the Gatling gun so it will fire off the rubber bands. And don't worry, the rubber bands barely come off. This Gatling gun is a threat to no one. Plus the kids have learned that the challenge with the Gatling gun is it takes you a very long time to the rubber band Gatling gun uh, to load it. So people are building them. I'm not sure how often they're going to really even use it. Okay. But same thing here with engineering. We were a prototype. And so we go through those steps. You know, build a new prototype, test prototype, make changes based on my results. You iterate, iterate, iterate. So when you do this exercise, we tell you, hey, you design a plane that's going to have four passengers, including the pilot. Each pilot was going to carry 20 pounds of luggage. We have a 150 knot cruise, and we're going to have a 550 nautical mile range. So then, and I've got the answers here, but we ask, we say, well, what's the average passenger weight? It's 170. How much luggage will they carry? 20 pounds. And then the ones in black, the answer. So the average weight per passenger is 190 pounds. You have four people. That means you're carrying about 760 pounds. All right. So. All right. So what is the weight of the airplane? Well, they have found through experience that if you take the total payload weight and divide by 30%, you get 253 pounds. Wings. All right. When we go to calculate size of our wings, first we calculate the wing building and then determine wing area. So we have the gross airplane weight. We decide what the standard wing load is. In this case, um, it's the cube of the weight minus 6 times 2.24. It ends up with 17 pounds per square foot. If you want high load wing loading, you multiply it by 1.2, low wing loading by 
which I just said a mouthful there. But it's just, we just calculated that weight. I give you the weight formula for standard wing loading. You work that out, and then you decide. This is the part you have to decide. Do you want a high wing load or low wing load? And we got in the wing loading, you'd learn about the advantages and disadvantages of each. Student makes a decision. Teachers, doesn't matter which one they pick in terms of right answers. You want to know why they picked what they picked. All right? You take the gross airplane weight, take the wing load range. All right? So are you a high wing or low wing based on that? In this case, we're going to say 17 pounds. The wing area is the gross airplane weight divided by wing loading. In this case, it's going to be 149 square feet. So that's the area of the wing. It's got to be 149 square feet. If you have an aspect ratio of 7, which is standard in small aviation, so that's a given, you calculate the wing area. All right. Previously calculated, 149. So wingspan is going to be 32 feet. That's based on um, the wing area times aspect ratio, taking the square root of that. It comes up with a chord. And these were all ideas developed through the years by the aviation industry. And then we go back and we start thinking about our brake horsepower. Let's see if you need 150 horsepower to get this airplane off the ground. That's your brake horsepower. Remember we said thrust horsepower is, is brake horsepower divided by 0.80%, higher number. You end up with 187 horsepower. Then you do thrust horsepower divided by 75 to give you your cruise horsepower. So while you need 150, you're going to end up with 270 rated horsepower. And based on that, we can then calculate our fuel. Taking all that information, we can fill out a table, what our wingspan and everything is, and you can design your airplane. That was a lot right there. But if we have it here, let me show you. And you've got the student version of this. You can see what the kids fill out, calculate. Let me see if I can get, let me show you what it looks like from that perspective. So, so here's the average passenger weight. How much do they like, each carry? They look it back up there and say 20 pounds of luggage. So they write it in there. So I want you teachers to see and students to see. They actually do the calculations. All right. Now, folks, there's got to be some questions there. Got any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Any questions? All right, there we go. Thank you. Someone's got a question. Seems pretty straightforward. Well, I'm glad it seems pretty straightforward to everybody. Awesome. That makes you, as a teacher, happy. All right. Let's talk again about taking off. Pause the airplane. Turn off the brakes. Pull up the throttle. Point the plane down the nose and take off. That's an important difference. Let me see if I can start it back up again. So we get a better flight performance out of this thing. I'll bring it up open. All right, let me see if we got any other questions. How do you get the nose to lift up? Okay, see my pointer here? There's a square when the plane gets up, I'll get you. When I pull this nose down, it's like pulling the, the, the uh, joystick back in an airplane. 
That causes, on the tail, there's a thing called an elevator. That causes the elevator to go up, which will cause, as the plane balances, to flip over. And I can show you why that is while this turns on. Let me go over here. There we go, wait a second. This is called what's called pitch stability. Your plane, we always talk, if you build model airplanes, always talk about the center of gravity. The reality is it's the center of lift that's the important part here. The, the center of gravity moment arm and the tail on moment arm have to balance. But just like on a teeter-totter, when you were a little kid and your dad or your parent and your do this. The little four-year-old sits at one end of the teeter-totter. She has to sit way out at the other end, so dad sits really close to the fulcrum, the point it balances. If he didn't, the kid would be five feet in the air, right? And you always see that where the person steps out and you push and the little person goes flying off the teeter-totter, right? On an airplane, that center of gravity is all the weight of the so that's very close. It's like being right at the fulcrum of the center of lift. Center of lift is based on the wing and the airfoil design, air shape. The tail moment arm, there's not a lot of force there. So we push it way back on the airplane. So if you think about it on an airplane, go back up here. F. I do things to this, if it's balancing right on that center part, and I tell the elevator, I, I pull the nose back, that causes this elevator to go up. If it's teetering right on that point, if this goes down, the nose is going to go up. Vice versa, if I push the nose, that stick forward, put the mouse up, the nose is going to go, it's going to tip over going the other way. The elevator will turn down causing it to flip forward. Hopefully we can get, where's my X-plane here? Let it fly. Go on fly with these options first. We'll see if it comes up. When it sits on a runway, I can show you there too. I hope that helped. I seem to... Uh, me, All right, let me see here. It seems to be a flight challenge. My students have success in, in flying. Is that a good to be? Is it going to be a problem? I seem to be flight challenged by my students have success in flying. No, it's just doing more of it. And the kids, I'll see see where the big difference is. The people who played a lot of video games pick up the software flying a lot faster than those who haven't. But you don't need, and that's why when we get low, closer to the contest, we're going to give people roles for the competition. And the people that fly better probably should pilot it. And the people that don't fly as well maybe are better at designing it. Everybody should get a chance to fly because for some, for a lot of times that's the most fun. Well, one million to load up here, so we'll figure out what's going on. And I'll show you right here. We had this in the first lesson. We moved this from where we used to have it. This shows about the three axes. Pitch is up and down this way. You have roll. And you have yaw. Yaw is left and right. So there's roll, pitch, yaw. Left and right is yaw. Pitch makes sense to most people, so does roll. And then we have you move the joystick or your mouse around, and you can see how the wings change. So let me show you what I'm talking about. If this will play well. All right, if I hit Shift-8, I'm outside my airplane. If I click on this, there's a little square. And hopefully, let me see if I can go around here. Let me see, let me see the difference.
see if I can get this back up. There's a little square there. See it? If I move that elevator up and down, I hope you can all see this now. That'll shift this airplane. If I do this, the nose is going up. If I do this, the nose is going to go down because it bounces along this wing. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. And folks, this makes a this balance is a crucial part of flying. So if the center of lift is about where that light is right there, so that's the center of lift. The center of gravity, where all the weight balances, is just slightly ahead of this. This has to balance out here. But if that's like a teeter totter in that fulcrum, you can imagine if I do this, the air is going to hit the bottom of that elevator. Right? The elevator's pointed down, that back half of the tail, causing the nose to go down. If I pull my joystick down like you can see me, the elevator goes up. The tail's going to go down, but the nose is going to go up. In this case, the tail's going to go up, therefore the nose has to go down. Again, also, you hit W to come back to the pilot's. There we are. So what we do here, use the arrow key. Shove that in. Let's pause it. I'm going to pause it up there for a second. I'm going to turn off the brakes. Come back to the square. There's a white square here. I'm going to unpause it. It's going to look choppy on the internet. But you're going to hear it. I'm going to turn the sound off so you don't hear that run. But the plane is moving down the runway. Uh, you always take out full throttle. I am not a pilot, but I have soloed. I have flown a plane by myself and landed it. One of those bucket list things. All right, here we go. Pull it up. I'm pulling it a little bit. Pause. Let's take a look at this outside. Shift 8. And the airfoil is slightly down. It's going to cause the tail to go down and the nose to go up. All right, great. Any other questions at this point? Anything from the first lab you had that you wanted to know about? Oh, let's go through just setting up. All right, so let's go here. If I go to a, I want to take off again from my airport. I go to local map. I go to load airport. And here's where we have. Now, this is a big airport, so you have all these runway choices. We're going to stay on takeoff and final approaches. So we're almost always starting at takeoff, but here's a final approach. Click on that, and you'll be in the air. All right, we're now in the air, and then we can do that. Hit Shift 8 again, and you can see it. There we are, out in the air. That's your final approach. All right, and it's under special. You go to flight challenges, and what you can do here, watch this. You can pick runways and change different parameters and fly. Let me show you that, and then if you need to go, I understand, and I'll stay on if you want me to. 
So I'm going to go back. So that's how if I want to fly in the air. Remember, this is where we wanted to go if I'm hit W again. I'm going to go up to settings, special. I'm going to go show flight model. Shift 8. Let's try it again. This, uh, special. Show flight model. Uh, that did not work where, where I want. It's special. You can also hit control M. Oops. I hit map. There it is. Control M. I had it on pause so you can see it. So here's my airplane. If I point the nose up, I my angle of attack increases my lift. But after a while, my air speed is bleeding away. And if I really point the nose up, it's going to have lift for a while. But pretty soon, that there's going to be nothing there. Then the plane's going to go down. If I point my nose down, it's going to gain air speed. But it's when I pull the nose up that it's going to get much higher, which you can't see from this angle. But oh, whoa, don't you? All right, I'm directly over top, so you don't see it. Oh, I'm going in the ground. There we go. No, crashed in there. But you can see all the lift. That's what they want you to see. See all the lift aspects on that. All right. And I'm back here. Now, you can go into, which is kind of where I wanted to go. Go to Flight Aviation Challenge. Now, you've got to be on the ground. You can't set this up mid-flight. That was a way to game the system in the past. You could get a higher score by just starting your flights a little bit. All right. And stupid red dots. You're going to need to know what airplanes you're going to use. Now, you're going to pick the airport you're going to take off from, and you're going to go. I'll show you one on the map where I, we fly to sometimes. But you can do... For adding weight, payload, fuel, time. You can change how much you're going to weight this in the formula. Usually it's the amount of payload delivered, the least amount of time using the least amount of fuel. But if you want to stress designs that put a premium on not using fuel, you can make that a much higher rating. If you want to put a premium on speed, you can do that as well. Now as far as getting your... The airport IDs, go back up to that map I showed you, location, local map. Over here are some of your ID, I, IDs you can do on this. So let's say we're starting here, one map, we're going to start here, and then there are some right nearby that you can fly. Any of these you can put in the settings with so Win93 if you wanted to go there. If you want to go to the Manchester Library, it's OBWA. These are the same thing pilots use, so that's why you see these. It tells you what angle you're coming in. All right? And also tells you the heading. Now, another one we like. Um, so, right now, let's go back to this map. Load airport. So, right now... There's Boeing Field if you want to take it off from that. And you can pick up another KBFI. We're at Seattle, but you could go there. And there's a Museum of Flight. So say you're going to go to Boeing Field. It's right near the Santa International Airport. You would need those three numbers, KBFI. And that might be KBFI. We're going to cancel that. Aircraft. Map. Okay, so we're at KBFI. So if you wanted to go to somewhere else, you can go, which is in Boeing Field International. This is giving our headings. We don't want that anymore. Like there's my airplane. 
you can go to park right here, win 93. It's just a little ways away. Now you need to change that. We're going in the wrong direction. Our heading's 315. Let me write that down. We need it to be opposite of that. So something like a heading of 180 or so. So, uh, and that flight field is win 93. WN93 Hyde Park. WN93. So what I would do is your takeoff's going that way right now, and you're taking off. Let's see here. Heading is 315. Let's go one way left. Now I'm pointed in the right direction. I'm at runway 315, right? And now I can go up to this airport right there. All right. Okay. So now I'm pointing in that way. Let's go in here. I think that's win, but I may have gotten the wrong win. So the departure air priority is KBFI, Boeing Field. We'll go back at the other one. But then I got to go back and look. K P A E Plainsfield, there it is. So now I have a departure runway and a takeoff going in the right direction. I hit that. And I'm ready to start on this. Okay? Are we going to have to take off and the Aviation Channel? They haven't set the rules yet. I would pick up different runways off that, Allison. And I'm so used to using the one in um, where we used to use in the Switzerland in that area that I uh, I don't know my runway numbers yet, clearly. Okay, but when you're just practicing with your students, you can do your runways. Any other questions? All right. If you weren't here last week, make sure you download these handouts. Um, I will post this and I will make a, uh, a playlist. And then we can get your students and we'll start putting them on the web page as well as our pay page. Any other questions? Let me see here. Well, if we don't have any more questions, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and log off here. And uh, thank you very much. Oh, I have a problem with loading scenery files when I go in to open the program. All right, I'm going to get to you, man. One second, Alan. So, a pleasure as always. Thank you very much, Marianne. All right, I have a problem loading scenery files when I go to open the program. Does it just hang up, Aladdin? Does it just keep. Got to give me a little more detail when it says loading scenery files. I would say you'd want to make one thing you can do too is we have limited scenery. You can download, actually, um, when you, if you get the program inside of Gamma, we give you the ability to load all kinds of different areas. But we do it mainly out of Seattle. Okay, I have a problem with loading the senior files when I go to open the program. Aladdin, I need to know what those are. What is exactly the problem, Aladdin? Does 